I'd like to get back to the concept of being beyond uh, already uh, elaborated by my colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth, uh, who talked a little bit about the Indian process of allowing uh, during the round of discussion. Uh, well, to start with, uh, I would like to dwell and hone in on a, a very insightful yet hard Frenchian uh, compassion made by the Turkish and uh, British born novelist and activist Elif Shafak. Uh, the confession goes as such. Uh, she says, Now, however, I felt as if a litter, worse that had been my lifelong companions, abandoned me and dissolved it into soggy letters like noodles of alphabet soup. End quote. She wrote this uh, after going through the throes of a postpartum depression that uh, comes along with uh, the deep uh, affliction of childbirth and pregnancy that uh, had a snowball effect on her like any woman, I mean, going through this uh, uh, traumatic experience. Um, this assertion, however, is frowned upon by Charles Perkins Gilman, uh, our author and the study. Uh, Gilman did metaphorically resurrect women in the other world paper from the rubble, from any of the rubble, and we did, I mean, uh, she did we did them to a revamped position um, to combat a middle space, I mean, or to do talk space in which they could, uh, I mean, um, have prominence and access to a voice at aesthetic and uh, political levels. This is how I took I mean, the prospect of utopia in the Yellow World paper. Um, Charles Perkins Gilman, for those who are not familiar with her works, or at least not that affiliated with her intellect, she is uh, an outspoken and uh, a vociferous I mean, feminist and activist, and uh, she did compel men, uh, so she did um, make I mean, compelling cases for women to um, get them the right position they deserve. Um, well, um, the rationale of my paper is positioned within the perspective of his utopia as enunciated by Michel Foucault and how he did digress um, away from the deadlock of uh, the way space was perceived by medieval culture as, as a solely functioning through uh, the ways of the hierarchy. So the new metaphors that uh, Coca in the words of Michel Foucault uh, do center on the tropes of uh, space anxiety, emplacement, and uh, uh, a rethought vision and perception of uh, space. Uh, well, the work and premise of my talk uh, is essentially to bring to the fore um, uh, uh, the way uh, Gilman uh, tackles uh, the notion of space in uh, her autobiography, or rather semi autobiographical, I mean, uh, story in the Yellow World paper. Uh, so, in a certain contrast to no space utopias, these utopias correspond to an in between hybrid space that functions in a non hegemonic way. To go further into this rationale, I will launch into delineating the bulk of the utopias. The bulk of the utopia interposed in the Yellow World paper. Shall I give you mine? Just mine. Is it my fault? No, no. it must be a phone. It must be a phone. Okay. There will be sorry. Okay. So the core of my talk here uh, does um, center on the bulk of. Uh, he took metaphors in the end wallpaper, arranging from the room essentially, um, the wallpaper itself, the entrapped woman behind the board, I mean, uh, uh, designs of the wallpaper. The text itself of the end wallpaper is a ground of hybridity. We cannot decide whether the diary written by Gilman, I mean, the replicated self of um, the weekly, I mean, uh, narrator is, I mean, uh, the umbrella text, or is it part of a Librivine narrative? So we could not <coughs> come to terms with this uh, puzzle or mass of uh, textuality. Uh, uh, the text itself, 
uh, has been haunted by specters of otherness and uh, deepness or deferral, to use uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, Derrida's perception, okay? And the overall contribution to uh, the establishment of a hybrid site of feminist resistance best fleshed out in the aesthetics of mobility and the poetics of transgression. Um, maybe uh, due to time constraints, I'll just skip that part allocated to define or introduce Charles Gilman for uh, the audience. Um, well, uh, I, I guess the overwhelming majority of scholars, uh, especially those engrossed by the literary and the circle, um, know quite considerably that Gilman uh, did um, contribute to uh, the realm of feminism and social reform uh, and the bid for the new woman uh, that rising uh, the end of the 19th century. Um, well, uh, I'd like to move on quickly and squarely to uh, the bulk of the rest of the premises uh, on which I um, base my talk. So my discussion of utopia in the Yellow World paper is set and positioned in the framework of spatial term and space anxiety as enunciated by Michel Foucault in his offsite essay of other spaces. Um, to start from the beginnings, uh, the use of the term utopia is essentially led back to its medical uh, use as being to use um, Michel Foucault's words parts of the body that are displaced, absent, extraneous, and foreign to the body, end quote. So in this particular context, he convinced that there are also, probably in every culture, in every civilization, real places that do, ex that do exist and that are formed in the very founding of society, which are something like country sites, a kind of effectively enacted utopia in which the real sites all the adequate real sites that can be found within the culture are simultaneously represented, contested, and inverted, end quote. So this reflection does lead us to um, deduce that, unlike utopias, heterotopias are hard to be crystallized and in a quite de defining and specific I mean, locality because they do lay midway between uh, opposites and extremes. So you see here, I mean, um, the, the big, uh, I would say, uh, or huge gap between heterotopias and utopias. So I'll start with the first uh, metaphor, or uh, the heterotopic metaphor uh, in the end world paper, I mean, the room here in this context. So in accordance with uh, Foucault's rumination on heterotopias as being utterly ever discursive, and there are more than one layer of meaning, we can justify and argue that the locked room in which the female narrator is enclosed is a place lying outside the orbit of known landscapes and spaces in her pursuit of weaving all her machines and a green line never ending game of meaning. So this perspective does run against Foucault's markedly ascertains Foucault's break with and digression from the long, uh, closed up and ossified myth of locality characteristic of the medieval era through which or through the workings of hierarchy. Another utopic metaphor that features in the annual paper is the hybrid or otherwise test. And here are two questions, two crucial interrogations come to the fore. Is the art of writing itself hybrid? Is it the site of contest and power game? So you see here the idea, I mean the ubiquitous idea of the text as being haunted, as being haunted by spectrums of otherness and uh, hybridity, or rather difference. Uh, so in this perspective, critics Gubor and Gilbert postulate that what they label as a quote here parallel confinements in taxes, houses, and humane bodies, end quote. So this assertion does draw us to consider the text as inherently swarming and brimful of confinement, as the level of a social cultural discursive practice. The condition of enclosure is country, challenging through the act of writing. And you see writing here does feature as a hybrid process. 
that never, I mean, uh, yields its full significance. So the act of writing itself proceeds in an optimal pace that grapples with forces of containment and the cycle of oppression. All the poses ellipses that figure in the other world paper might lead readers at the loss as to unfathom the deep meaning betokened by her words, which conversely events gaps and instances of hesitation or even an enforced muteness as a painstaking experience of an entangled woman. Uh, I, I think I'll, I'll be compelled to skip a lot of parts and uh, about theoretical premises. So to continue with this idea, with this line of thought, I found Foucault's uh, claim on the utopias as quite relevant to my uh, point here. He surmised what follows. He said, Heterotopias desiccate speech, stop words in their tracks, contest the very possibility of drama at its source, they dissolve our mythos and sterilize the lyricism of our sentences. End quote. So, in like manner, the narrator in the annual paper comes across as, uh, sorry, the narrator's diary in the annual paper comes across as caught by a multitude of determinations and trappings. In spite of her remitting, in spite of her remitting endeavor toward its completion, to assert her inner subjectivity and body as well. Now I'd like to capitalize a little bit on the mode of Gothicism in the annual paper and how it is useful as a general form to provide uh, a context and hidden ground for ways to tackle and um, come to terms with the condition of victimization that uh, surrounds women uh, in America and, and elsewhere. Uh, the building of the mansion room in which the, the female rating is entangled is very, is an old, uh, sorry, this back, sorry, it is dated back to the earliest ages of slave shipping in America, that prescient of the Karmakan, the surveying apparatus along with the patro patrolling gaze of the body polluted. In discipline and punish, uh, Foucault alludes to how prisoners are observed all the time. And this is echoed um, uh, adequately in the annual paper in, in the sense that Jean keeps a constant watch on his wife during her rest cure after uh, going through a deep and intense uh, postpartum depression. So, um, <coughs> even in terms of architecture, I found that the, the room or the colonial mansion as land and resemblance to uh, other spaces of confinement uh, proper to harems in the East, Purga establishments in the Far East, especially in medieval India, and how they do um, reinforce and bolster, I mean, uh, um, uh, the power of surveillance uh, of the women. Now I'd like to say uh, a few words on uh, the warfare uh, or the class <coughs> or the disjunction between science and art, or rather between the aesthetic and the material in the alcohol paper, okay? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I found this uh, warfare between science and art uh, as a proper theoretical terrain from which to handle um, and uh, tackle the narrator's struggle against an abusive uh, order of materialism, and uh, by so doing, Gilman portrays the utopic space as quint essentially female and feminized um, by instigating war on the uh, abusive uh, law of, of homogenizing the power of our women. I know, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be compelled to skip a huge part of my talk, so I will just uh, jump to my conclusion. So, I'll, um, so after going through this um, detailed account and folding of the of the token that was in the annual paper, I found inspiration in uh, Jacques Dida's claim on difference or a difference in French. 
and his distinction between law and justice, while he defines the former, I mean law, as an institutional edifice, it is, in its obvious literal significance, he reflects on another letter as being a desire and a promise. Justice is, I quote, infinite, incalculable, rebellious to rule and foreign to symmetry, heterogeneous and heterotopic, end quote. This theoretical postulation fits well the context of the short story, the annual paper at hand, and that it spells out the thematics of hybridity as an instigator of action set against the obsolete and worn out pretense of meaning reliability. Additionally, I'd like to hone in on the concept of the census coined by Jacques Rancière, which is a ground between consensus and dissidence. Uh, here, um, the concept of the census is quite commensurate with Gilman's creation of the Utopia and Yellow World paper, as it becomes a, a notion that, I quote, cuts across forms of cultural and, and identity belonging and hierarchies between discourses, genres, working to introduce new subjects and indigenous objects in the field of perception and the culture. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Karina, for your short read of, uh, of uh, Gilman's uh, Yellow Paper. I'm really wondering, what's, what's that movie? It's done from... Telephone. Right, so... I said, I mean, uh, you uh, really succeeded, and, and I, I really appreciate what you said about uh, Foucault and how you uh, applied the, the theory of the uh, on uh, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the text, uh, how you read the space and uh, the, the female body. And I'm sure my friend and colleague Nadia Patul has many things to say uh, on that topic because she has recently released a, and published an article on uh, architecture and uh, archi yeah, architecture and space. In the yellow, and metaphor in the yellow wallpaper. I was so hampered by, by time constraints. It's okay. It's okay. I feel guilty about it. <laughs> it's okay. I, I know. I know that it's not enough, but we need to about, abide by the by the time constraints. Yeah. We have 20 presenters today. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. So uh, let me uh, uh, give the floor to uh, our dear friend and colleague uh, Siham Atewi. Uh, the title of our uh, presentation is Secret Time by Leila Lalani, Pleasures and Pains of Cultural Hybridity. The floor is yours. Hello again. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Dr. Nadar, for this uh, presentation. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the organizing committee uh, for their you know, successful organization of this uh, big event and uh, for uh, their uh, generosity that shows up all uh, steps of this scientific uh, encounter. Uh, now, considering the uh, brochure uh, between your hands, the official uh, talk or the title of the official talk announces itself as Pleasures and Pains of Cultural Hybridity in Secret Sun by Laila Lalami. My talk, however, will be on pains first, pleasures second, just as short as of hybridity in Secret Sun by Laila Lalami. You might have uh, wondered why this late or recent turn up or play up with the wording of the title that was originally submitted to the reading committee. Now, apart from the time uh, constraints, uh, there is the notion of pain as an integral part of pleasure. Uh, also, the idea of hybridity as an essence of the aporia of the post-colonial and the diasporic identities being negotiated through the work under discussion. I had in mind also the purpose of enclosing the plurality of hybridity in linguistic, cultural, religious, and ethnic perimeters, that is, reinforcing the principle of inclusion rather than exclusion. So that was my rationale behind this turnout. 
At another level, and from a theoretical perspective, it is a crucial reminding that this paper is written in the background of hybridity as a blending of two or several aspects of linguistic, religious, cultural, or, or ethnic identity. I'm aware of such related concepts of hyphenation, syncreticism, creolization, mestiza, among others, of their affinities, but also of their slight divergences. But there is no point into uh, or, or about you know opening parentheses on these interrelations in such uh, a brief presentation. My presentation is based on the assumption that no culture is free from outside influences, particularly in the light of cultural globalization. By the same token, every culture is by definition hybrid, that is a fusion of dominant and dominated cultural aspects, or also an amalgam of local and global components. Secret Song, in particular, articulates a culture of hybridity via diverse poetics, encompassing namely language, setting, character, theme, as well as diverse politics, including assimilation, acculturation, indigenousness, authenticity, distortion, and the list is long. The novel under consideration delineates hyphenation in linguistic and cultural terms basically as a mix of post-colonial and diasporic controversies. Now, within all of this, what is the argument of, the, of this uh, paper? The third space I argue through secret sound is intrinsically embedded within a dialectic of pain and pleasure that is best embodied through the psychological struggles as experienced by the characters inhabiting a state of in betweenness. Though, in principle, I should tackle pains and pleasures of hybridity in La 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 Secret Sun, as well as their external and internal negotiations, yet uh, I will just give you the avant goût if you wish, with the full promise to have your full bite once this paper is, you know, comes to a full shape, hopefully for the forthcoming proceedings. This being said, Secret Song is already hybridized in terms of text and context. The novel is predicated on hybridity from within and without, giving its author's status as a tribal hybrid. As an Anglophone Moroccan writer by birth and upbringing, Lelani is born in Morocco but educated between her birthplace, particularly Mohammed V University for a licence in English, University College of London for the Masters, and the University of Southern California for a PhD in Linguistics. Lelani is currently based in the United States as a teacher assistant of creative writing at the University of California, Riverside. Until her early 20s, Lelami was writing everything in French because of an early exposure to French literature. She does not consider that a hindrance or an exception or an oddity. She reflects on the aporia of linguistic hybridity for post-colonial writers, stating, quote, after all, many of Morocco's writers used the colonial tongue, and I'm sure that uh, uh, you're already familiar with the Katibi uh, and Asya Jabbar from Algeria, also Fatima Mournisi, you know, she's switching between uh, the only work she wrote in English was Dreams of Trespass, but for the rest of her philosophical, you know, uh, books, they were uh, rather expressed in French. So by writing in a colonial language, Lalami mirrors her linguistic skills in the colonizer's language in as much as she writes back to the West and articulates a sort of mimicry. The question that imposes itself here is uh, why and how does Lalami all of a sudden switch from French to English? There are obvious reasons for this, as well as implicit factors. For her, the alternative of writing in standard Arabic, if we take her novel tongue, 
is neither quite obvious nor much of an option, especially in view of Ngugi's prominent understanding, but it requires the great writer Ngugi states to quote immediately cast aside the colonial tongue and return to the need to one. End of quote. In her case, Lalami does not express her intention to write in Arabic with respect to her inarticulateness in her native language, as uh, uh, many of us are. As she explains it, the Arabic language, she, she says, is often referred to al al-Arabi al-Fusha, or the eloquent Arabic language. I sorely lack that eloquence, end of quote. Her attitude poses a larger identity issue for the people of the Maghreb, wherein the standing of Arabic or the positioning of Arabic as the official language does not necessarily translate as our spoken language or even native language. The gradual switch from French to English could be explained from different angles that have to do with the fact that it is closely connected to a constant contact with English as a researcher first, which in turn facilitates fiction writing in a foreign language, but essentially makes Lalami's hybridity further complex. In her late twenties, the author tries her hands at writing fiction in English. After all, she lives in the United States and has a Western mind in audience, let alone the international understanding of English as the most spoken language worldwide, followed by French, of course. Lelami ends up offering, in total up to now, four novels, including Secret Sun in the range of, I uh, cite here, Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, The Moore's Account, published in 2014, The Other Americans, 2019, a collection of essays entitled Conditional Citizens on Belonging in America, published in 2020. Now we come to the text. From the author, we go to the text. So, although the medium of the text and their consideration is dominantly in English, its characters equally straddle between a French, Moroccan dialect, or Derja, with less focus on Tamazite, the Berber language, and even less on Spanish. The author transliterates Arabic dialect in Tamazite. In the bourgeois context, for example, of the Amranis, around whom the whole plot is turning, French like, runs like a second nature to them when speaking to each other, while exceptionally using Derija Arabic only with the servants articulating a post-colonial identity, but also deeper meanings having to do with social strata in Morocco. Conversely, Yusuf's unexpected eloquence in French is no surprise since it stems from his mother's early exposure to French in Beb Zayed orphanage run at that time by French nuns. Proud of his flawless French as a potential passport to integrate with his students who are far beyond his social belonging as a major in English, Yusuf starts cherishing the possibility of gaining acceptance into what he calls, quote, the Mercedes and Marlboro's group, end of quote. Passing out for a native speaker of French emerges out as an outstanding source of pleasure for the protagonist in the sense that it provides him with the comfort and reassurance of deserving a new affiliation with his recently discovered biological father since he plays the role of a bastard child. In either case, the ability to transfer from Moroccan dialect to French is empowering, thus reinforcing code switching as a linguistic and social privilege, an emblem also of the character's eloquence, social belonging, but also a post-colonial heritage. Now, at a deeper textual thematic level, the considered novel most articulates hybridity as a conflicting site of pain and pleasure via their interstitial journeys of its hyphenated characters. Secret Sun shows that the character's identity and culture are modified or hybridized either by their post-colonial experience or by their immigration to America.